May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable unto thee, O Lord. Amen. Please be seated. So keep calm and witness on. You're facing down a giant Philistine warrior. Keep calm and witness on to the power of Yahweh. Your family fishing boat is sinking in an unexpected storm. Keep calm and witness on to the power of Jesus Christ. Your city and church are changing faster than you can imagine. Keep calm and witness on to the power of the Holy Spirit. Our scriptures today are all about persevering in faith and witnessing to how the power of God delivers us in times of need. So we start today with the story of David and Goliath. Goliath, who was this Philistine warrior trained from birth to fight, and who stood six cubits tall with an armor that weighed 5,000 shekels. I always knew Goliath was big, but until this week I never really looked it up. Right? How big is six cubits? Eight foot? Ten foot? Eleven feet, y'all. How much is 5,000 shekels of bronze? A hundred pound armor? 150 pound armor, 180 pounds of armor. And so Goliath made Andre the Giant look like a jockey at the Kentucky Derby. Right? This dude was huge. And by contrast, right, we get David, who's described kind of like a backstreet boy. Right? Short little dude, he doesn't really want to wear armor or a sword. And the contrast between these two combatants couldn't be any larger. And that's the point, right? David doesn't defeat Goliath because he's the greater warrior. David defeats Goliath because he trusts in the power of Yahweh to deliver him and eventually all the people of Israel. David's gift isn't his aim with the sling. David's gift is his trust in God. A trust born out of shepherding, where he rescued sheep from the mouths of lions and bears. A trust in God that will continue to serve him throughout his time as king of Israel. And so long as he aligns his life with this trust in God, so long as he seeks to serve the will of Yahweh, Everything turns out all right, even if it's not the all right he expected. We all have our giants staring us down. 11-foot financial debt, cancer wearing 180-pound armor. But God is with us. God has delivered us before, and so long as we continue to look for God's in these circumstances, God will continue to show up, although it's usually in ways we don't expect either. Keep calm and witness on to the power of Yahweh. Chronologically speaking, the next story we come to is Jesus in the boat. Again, I was curious about how much trouble were the disciples really in. So I looked up how big their boat was. And it turns out it's about 27 feet long, 8 feet wide, and about 4 feet deep. So this isn't a canoe in the San Marcos River that's taking on, river, on water, but it is a full-sized fishing vessel, and waves are crashing over the gunnels, filling the craft with water. Curiously enough, the disciples weren't worried about capsizing. Right? So this isn't a storm where we're seeing 20-foot waves rise on the Sea of Galilee. But it is an unexpected storm caused by catabatic winds coming down from the Golan Heights and creating lots of little waves that are starting to swamp the boat. 
And Jesus, Jesus is sleeping soundly in this storm, which clearly irks the disciples. And it gets them all riled up and to the point where they finally come to him in a frenzy and say, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And Jesus responds, Peace, be still. It says Jesus spoke these words to the wind and the sea, and that's true. But part of me thinks he was also speaking them to the disciples. Peace, be still. We all face unexpected storms in our lives, events that give us that sinking feeling in our stomachs, unusual lab results, check engine lights, requests for parent-teacher conferences, but Christ is with us in these moments as well. It may seem like he's asleep in the stern, but he's there, y'all. And like the disciples, we do well to seek him out. We do better by not jumping into hysterics, but instead by practicing a little peace, a little stillness. But in the end, the disciples get it right. When the going gets tough, the first and the best thing we can do is to be still, to seek out Christ, and to pray. Keep calm and witness on to the power of Christ. And so finally, we come to our second Corinthians reading today. So the city of Corinth was founded by freed slaves, by retired soldiers, and by international merchants. Their unique backgrounds, their skill sets, and their, their experiences, coupled with Corinth's geography along major trade routes, created the perfect storm of a population explosion. The tiny church that Paul founded in 51 AD grew rapidly, even in his absence. Initially, Paul could deal with all these growth issues by sending letters. And this is the story behind 1 Corinthians, right? Which was basically, you know, a bishop sending emails to congregations that he's trying to lead. 1 Corinthians was roughly 53 AD, about a year or two after Paul left. And so, you know, in Paul's time, this looked like, hey, can we eat meat to idols, right? Today, it sounds like things like, hey, can we do communion over Zoom? Y'all remember that question? Lord have mercy, I'm glad I wasn't a bishop. All right. Um, so anyways, this, the, this is the, the story behind 1 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, though, y'all, it's a totally different letter. In fact, we think it's a composite of at least two letters, maybe as many as six and they're coming five years after Paul has founded this community. The congregation has continued to grow, but now they're worried about outside influences. In fact, they're even worried about Paul's outside influence. He hasn't been there in five years. And so he's starting to feel like an outsider passing judgment instead of an insider trying to meet the needs of the people on the ground. The church in Corinth is starting to circle the wagons. They're starting to put up walls in response to their growth. And Paul is urging them to remain open. Open to new people showing up. Open to the people that founded the community. And above all, open-hearted to the Holy Spirit. And Paul is speaking from experience, right? He goes on to say he knows that holding that kind of openness, that kind of middle way, it's not easy. People will treat you like imposters. They will slander you, impoverish you, ignore you, and even punish you for staying open-hearted. But it's okay. It's worth it. This is the work of Christ. And in the end, it leads to a more beloved community and a closer walk with God. The city of San Marcos is going through a population explosion not unlike Corinth's. St. Mark's continues to grow and face challenges we've never seen before. 
We've done a good job in trying to welcome seekers into our midst, to encourage people to bring new ideas, new energy, new blood into the parish. And we continue to try and honor longtime Episcopalians and traditions who have laid and maintained the, the physical, financial, and liturgical foundations of faithfulness in this place. We are in a unique place to embrace both the innovative spirit of Austin and the frontier spirit of San Antonio. We are a church of the middle way in so many ways. And the world needs us now more than ever. So sisters and brothers, siblings of the faith, keep calm and witness on. Witness on to the power of Yahweh working in your lives. Witness on to Christ who shows up to calm the storms of our lives. And witness on to the Holy Spirit who lives and moves and has their being in our lives and in the community around us. Amen.